All right, so today we're talking uh, about feeding the world, chapter 11. And the opening story is one you'll want to read, and it'll sound familiar because it's the guy, Joel Salatin, who works at Polyface Farms, who we uh, saw in Food, Inc. And he tries to use nature as much as possible for his farming operation um, to try and reduce the impact that humans are having. So read that introductory story. It's pretty good. About 10,000 years ago is when the agricultural revolution hit. And before that, people were just, you know, um, dealing with natural influxes of plants and, and animals. And so there were times of famine, there were times of scarcity, and people had died b because of that. Um, but starting with the agricultural evolution revolution, people were starting to more people were starting to be fed. Um, you can see here that undernutrition, which we'll describe in a second, has gone down or had gone down from the 60s to the mid 90s, mostly because of the Green Revolution, but has since risen. 24,000 people still starve to death every day and most of this in developing countries and mostly in part and mostly in part mostly due to reduced government assistance for agricultural development um, and in other parts of the world uh, the rise in fuel costs and just the entire global economic downfall has has caused a lot of issue with getting food to the masses um, even in the US it's it's a problem with with children. So some key terms as far as uh, nutrition are undernutrition, which is simply not getting enough calories in order to be hungry. So the normal diet would be 22 kilocalories a day, um, but in, in people who are only taking in 100 to 400 calories less than what you need deprives them of any kind of nutrients. Malnourished is uh, lacking balance of proteins, carbs, vitamins, minerals, even if they get enough or more than enough calories. This is a big problem that we're having in the U.S. with all the processed foods we're eating, not enough fruits and vegetables, not enough natural grains, um, particularly in children, so they're not getting really the vitamins and nutrients that they need. Overnutrition is simply having too many calories and then improper foods. And so again, uh, in affluent countries, and particularly the U.S., um, overnutrition is a huge problem, which is causing obesity. And 300 million people in the world are obese. And, and that's pretty sad because that's just, you know, there's, too much available availability of food um, and especially fast food and so much of it is processed and so they're not getting the nutrients they need so think again of the McDonald's dollar menu you know you're filling up on a dollar but there's very little nutritional value food security is the condition in which people have access to sufficient safe and nutritious food that meet their needs and access refers to the economic, social, and actual physical availability of food. So insecurity would mean that people do not have uh, access, adequate access to food. Famine is, is when uh, food insecurity is so extreme that large people will die in a short amount of time, usually due to a crop failure, drought, or political causes. Um, sometimes the, the prices will go really high and then there's riots and then sometimes the government will limit how much food is available. Uh, crop failures, we've heard of the Irish potato famine before um, and there are large consequences for famine. Here on the left you see people were dying in the early 20s in a Russian famine. On the right, an African girl who, who suffers from kwashiorkor, 
which is uh, not getting enough protein. So their bellies just kind of blow up with, with gas, but there's no real food. Others to do with malnutrition, vitamin A deficiency causes blindness. Um, anemia, which is a deficiency of iron, is the most nutritional, is the most widespread nutritional deficiency in the world. And goiters are normally associated with an iodine deficiency. Um, and we avoid goiters here in the U.S. because we add iodine to our salt. So if you ever notice, the salt says iodized. That is the reason for that. Uh, so anemia, not getting enough iron, is generally in, in countries where they're not able to get enough um, meat or fish. Um, but then you also have other causes for anemia, which could be malaria, which could be AIDS, um, which could be uh, infestations from parasites. Grains make up the largest component of the human diet globally. Globally, um, corn, wheat, and rice are the three main crops which make up 60% of human energy intake. Meat is the second largest, and meat would be livestock and poultry. Generally, um, as uh, a country increases in their in economic growth, people will tend to eat more meat and add them to their diet. So typically developing countries don't have as much access to meat and can't afford them. Um, so, so hence they don't eat a whole lot of it. Soy is also a, another crop that's pretty big, but I'm guessing that's number three, uh, excuse me, number four after rice. This is simply showing you how globally the United States eats more meat than most countries, but meat has gone up um, as part of the Industrial Revolution. This is also showing you that global grain production has risen because of the Green Revolution, which we'll talk about. Although the per capita uh, grain production has leveled off in recent years. So the number one reason that people are not getting enough nutrients or not getting the right amount of nutrients is poverty. So the, the lack of the resource that allows one access to food is poverty. Um, a political and economic factors, so see there, refugees who leave their home due to war or natural disasters such as flooding or hurricanes like in Haiti uh, don't have access to their food. One of the biggest problems, though, that not enough people are getting access to food or, or, or getting the food is because so much of the crops and grains that are grown globally is fed to feed livestock. I mean, is grown to feed livestock. And in the U.S., our two largest crops, corn and soybeans, are primarily used for animal feed. So, you know, there's a low energy transfer there because it takes a lot of crops to feed those beef in order to get, you know, that energy back. So it's possible that if we cut back on food, um, excuse me, on meat or beef and became more um, herbivores, then more food is going to be available to people because it's not going to animals, it's going to people. To feed everyone in the future, we will have to put more land into agricultural production, improve, improve crop yields, reduce consumption of meat, harvest more fish, or a combination of the above. With more food comes more people who require even more food production, and that is a positive feedback loop. So once the Industrial Revolution took off, farming became more mechanized. So more machines, fewer people so less cost for labor, but more fossil fuel energy was being used. So that's obviously going to be um, a detriment to the environment by using so much fossil fuel. But at the same time, when it was getting mechanized, more food was being able to be uh, collected and all at once. 
The problem that we saw at the end of Food Inc. was the energy used to get that food from store to your plate. And an average food item takes 1,500 to 2,000 kilometers um, worth of traveling from the farm or wherever to your kitchen. That has a lot of energy going on just to get some food to you. And that was one reason why I had used the strawberries example from Poteet was that strawberries are, you know, many are grown just 25 minutes outside of town and yet the strawberries we're getting here in town are from California. Now I understand that not so many um, growers in Poteet can, can provide for all of the HEBs in San Antonio, but certainly they could go to some stores. And I have yet to see any poteet strawberries in my stores, even on the you know west side of town or southeast side of town where uh, poteet is closer to. So that was one thing that we need to think about as consumers is is trying to buy locally so that it doesn't have to travel as far and you're giving local farmers um, more business. So how did we get to the point where um, we were so highly dependent on fossil fuel and we were growing all these uh, crops so quickly and in such abundance? Well, that's due to the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution started um, in the 60s and, well, I guess the 40s, sorry, the 40s, where new management techniques were used along with fertilization, irrigation, and crop varieties, which would include GMOs. So all of these new things increased food production dramatically. So Norman Borlaug won the Nobel Peace Prize for um, increasing the world food supply. He did this because he developed strains of wheat that produced higher yields, so more wheat, disease resistant, and uh, so due to this world grain production had doubled due to his discovery. So by the 1990s, um, grain production had increased so great, um, and mostly due to mechanization. So when you're farming, you've got to plow the land, you've got to plant it, you've got to keep it wet, so irrigate it, you've got to weed it out, you've got to protect it from pest, you've got to harvest it, and then you have to get ready for next season. So there's a lot of work to be done that goes into farming and machines can do it faster and in bigger quantities. Not necessarily better than a person, but that's why they were using more machinery. Then they also started to go to um, just solo crops or monocropping, which I'll talk about again in a second. That way they could harvest a giant area of land all at once and not have to worry about another crop being in the way. Um, so since mechanization really started, they've been able to harvest more grain um, at all at once. Um, with irrigation, now it, it's good and it's bad. Irrigation has been able to bring water to places where they might not have to, to crops where they might not have been grown otherwise. So an example that they gave you in the text was um, in California where there used to be a desert they started irrigating it and is now a producer of fruits and vegetables. But think about that. You know it it didn't used to be ir irrigated it was a desert and to me they should have found a better location than a desert even though it's very productive now but think about how much water goes into that. And, it, you know, especially in San Antonio, when we're a city who is so dependent on an aquifer for our water and we use water for irrigation, groundwater, those uh, supplies could be very quickly depleted. And when you deplete 
um, an aquifer very quickly by over pumping depending on the location you could let um, salt water in from the ocean um, you have subs subsidence where the land is sinking in because of over pumping um, also soil can get degraded in some places so two, two samples of that are water logging and salinization water logging is when you've irrigated a location and it ends up sitting in water so the roots just basically drown in the water because the water doesn't go anywhere and then the roots can't get the oxygen salinization is when uh, salts in the irrigation water become really concentrated so depending on where you you are getting that water sometimes they are um, hard water um, and have lots of mineral and salt deposits and so you you spray that on these crops for so long and you end up getting um, salty soil and then that's just degrading the soil and the crops cannot grow anymore so there's a picture I used to have a picture of salinized soil and I don't have that anymore um, but but what you'll notice that because it'll have like this real thin white layer on top of the soil and that's the salt um, part of the green revolution was also adding fertilizers and there's two types of fertilizers there's organic and inorganic and of course from the perspective of an environmentalist or a really good sustainable farmer you want to use as organic as possible and not synthetic so organic matter is typically animal manure that has been allowed to decompose and they spread it over the crops and so those will return naturally some of those nutrients um, that were removed when the crops were harvested in the first place inorganic fertilizers are also called synthetic and that's when they are made uh, commercially in a factory um, so that's giving them the the nitrogen phosphorus and potassium that soils need it's just man-made or synthetic the problem with that is that you have to use fossil fuel energy in order to produce or manufacture the synthetic fertilizers um, also if you're using too much in an area that may not need it as much um, it can be carried off in the runoff water and in that runoff water that can lead to eutrophication we've talked about that before too much nitrogen or too much phosphorus in water can lead to over nutrients so algae and, and such will feed on that then they die decompose and use up all the oxygen so they become the waters become anoxic um, so you know the goal if you're a farmer is to try to use organic and as less inorganic as possible Uh, monocropping is basically uh, growing large amounts of a single species of plant so we've got wheat crops or wheat farms corn farms soy farms um, you know one of the benefits is because you can use your your machines to gather all these plants at once and to harvest them all at once not having to worry about another crop but when you harvest a crop all at once in one large area it exposes that soil uh, to the elements so it could be very easily eroded or uh, degraded particularly if you're in a windy area or um, a very rainy area look at what happened with the dust bowl in the 30s the dust bowl in the 30s was caused by people not using sustainable or good farming practices and the soil uh, became infertile and they couldn't plant in it and so it just became dry it um, couldn't hold on to any crops and it was very easily eroded and blew away with the wind hence the dust bowl also by having one crop a monocrop you know sometimes the natural pests uh, excuse me the natural predators that feed on pests in crops have other homes that they um, or other habitats that they go to and when you have one monocrop those predators 
don't have their second home, don't have that habitat that they need. So then you remove some of those predators, which then in turn make you have to depend more on pesticides, which brings us to pesticides. Use of pesticides have become very routine in agriculture and you know we could not have grown as much as we have without them. The point is to, to use them as responsibly as possible. A pesticide is a substance that kills or controls organisms that we humans consider pests. Insecticides get insects, herbicides get plants, rodenticides get rodents, fungicides fungi, and uh, nematicides target worms. So the U.S. Um, accounts for about one-third of worldwide pesticide use. So of course here we are again using probably more of something that we should. Um, there are two categories of pesticides. One is broad spectrum, meaning that if I sprayed it on something it would kill many types of pests. Um, selective pesticides then will only kill what you intend it to kill. And so those are going to be really more what you want to have as a farmer um, or even in your backyard if you're trying to get rid of say you know an ant problem you you should find a, um, an insecticide that's only going to kill the ants and nothing else and that's really a big problem of pesticides. We already know that using pesticides is going to allow greater crop yields. So you get more food for the same amount of area, but there are negative consequences too. Persistent pesticides are those that will remain in the environment a long time. We saw that DDT had a half-life of, of 35 years, so it's going to take a few generations for the DDT that was banned 40 years ago to be gone from our soil. Non-persistent means that it's going to break down relatively quickly. So um, the pesticide Roundup, uh, or I should say the er herbicide Roundup, is considered non um, non persistent because it breaks down relatively quick. quick. Bioaccumulation we talked about uh, two chapters ago with the toxicity chapter. Bioaccumulation is what happens when toxins are built up in fatty tissues over time. Okay, um, the example was DDT and what happened was you know as the DDT was sprayed on crops there would be runoff into the water, plankton ate the DDT, small fish ate the plankton, larger fish ate the smaller fish, and predatory birds ate the large fish. So by the time that it got to the, the, the bird there was a lot of concentration of that DDT and it caused their uh, eggshells to be very brittle um, and thin so that uh, baby birds weren't being born so there was a decline in the population. So as um, as the pesticide moves up the food chain, which is biomagnification, then it will accumulate in large quantities at the top of the food chain. One issue with pesticides also is resistance. Over time, and it makes sense, that if you're using a certain pesticide and it works to eradicate that pest, over time some will develop a resistance, just as you could develop a resistance to certain antibiotics. You know, myself was I was given the Z pack, you know, that five day um, antibiotic so many times when I was a child. Now when they give it to me, I tell them not to because it, it doesn't work. I've just become resistant to that particular antibiotic. And so the same things will happen with uh, pests and pesticides. So once a pest becomes resistant to the pesticide, then it's up to the farmer to get another one. Uh, a new pesticide and then over time that pest will resist that pesticide and will keep going and going. So the pesticide treadmill is another example of a positive feedback loop. So the Green Revolution um, also started 
genetic engineering. And there are some good things with genetic engineering, there's no doubt, but it's just also some negatives. Benefits, obviously, when you are um, being modified to increase your output of seeds in a plant, you're going to get greater yield and hopefully better quality because what scientists are doing is manipulating those genes um, to produce organisms with all those desirable traits. So if you've got the desirable traits of large um, fruit and a, big, a bigger capacity of that fruit to grow larger, um, then that's going to be successful. You're going to be able to feed more people in a shorter amount of space. Um, they've also um, picked traits that were resistant to certain um, pests so that they would not have to use so much pesticides. And so it did increase profits if they weren't losing their crops to pesticides or um, drought. Golden rice was an example, as you see right there, which was a genetically modified rice where they injected beta carotene into the grain so that they could try and reduce the blindness or the vitamin A deficiency in developing countries. But there are going to be concerns about GMOs, and, and it's understandable. I would have, I do have concerns about GMOs, maybe not as much with plants, but with animals. Um, people are concerned about whether or not certain GMOs are, are safe for human consumption. They're worried about allergic reactions, although I haven't really heard of that being a huge problem, although, you know, we might not know that. Also, affects on biodiversity. It makes sense that if you were only going to take the desired traits of some organisms to make one, you're taking away some other species from growing and being prolific and surviving because obviously the one with all the desired traits are going to survive and reproduce. So you're going to to lose some biodiversity and that obviously is not a good thing in the environment. Um, the regulation of genetically modified organisms. You saw a clip of that, of, of the litigation of that in the movie Food Inc., where companies did not see it necessary to label, to label um, their products that it contains GMOs because they didn't want to um, instill fear in people. They didn't want them to not buy the product because they would be afraid because they didn't know what GMOs were. And my opinion is still about that. Well, then educate them on what GMOs are. If what they have is, you know, in there is a grain of rice that, you know, it is helpful to the world in that you're growing more rice to feed more people in a smaller amount of space, then that's a good thing. Um, but there are, so, so right now there are no regulations as far as labeling a GMO. Um, so if you did not want a GMO at all, then you would want to go buy organic because organics do not have GMOs. Uh, farming methods. So conventional agriculture is, um, which is today's methods, are industrial agriculture where labor is reduced and machinery is used. So heavy reliance on fossil fuels. Traditional farming is, you know, the old school farming, what we used to do in the days where the humans tend the land and the humans harvest the crops and get them ready. Um, and take out the seeds and separate them from the rest of the plant. So uh, much of the developing world still uses that. Shifting agriculture um, is used in areas with nutrient poor soil. So what they'll do is they'll plant a crop in an area for a little while until they've used up that crop, um, the, the soil's fertility for, for using that crop and then they'll go and move to another area and repeat the process. Nomadic grazing is when you move um, your animals to find productive feeding grounds. So they'll feed on the grass for a little while and then they move on. And then the other land is allowed to recoup and the grass can grow back again. 
So often what has happened, like I said with the dust bowl, when you plant a crop and harvest it over and over and over again and not allow that soil to recoup and get some of those nutrients back and just recover from the strain of the harvesting, the soil is going to go infertile. It's not going to hold on to the nutrients, so therefore it's not going to hold on to the roots of plants and it's basically going to become dead. And you've seen probably really dead, dry, useless soil that lacks color. Um, well, that's part of desertification when they've used soil so much that they cannot be productive. And so here's a map that just shows you um, where desertification is becoming a big problem. And northern China, although it's not in there yet, northern China is having issues um, because of their, you know, trying to feed all those people. So sustainable agriculture is a goal and that's when you're feeding uh, the world's population without destroying the land, without polluting the environment, and without reducing biodiversity. So it's quite complex because there's so many steps that involve to try to reduce the impact on the environment as much as possible. Intercropping is one way of um, trying to sustain the land and that's when you plant two or more crop species um, in the same field at the same time. So for instance you could um, uh, plant corn which needs a lot of nitrogen and you can plant it alongside peas which actually fixes nitrogen because it's a legume and legumes are the, the nitrogen fixing crops. Um, so, and that reduces the use for um, a nitrifying fertilizer for the corn. Crop rotation is when you're ro rotating crops from season to season. So with the corn and peas, if I'm only going to do a monocrop, well then I would plant corn one year and then I would plant peas, actually I would plant peas first since they're nitrogen fixing um, so it has all that extra nitrogen in the soil and then I plant the corn in there so again less fertilizer is needed. Intercropping um, with ag uh, trees is called agroforestry and so you see in that picture there that there are crops planted with trees around so the trees can act as windbreaks that um, catch soil that might be blown away so it's not eroded away and then it also gives fruit and firewood to the farmers. Lastly is contour plowing and that is when you can see in that picture there that they um, plant and harvest their crops parallel to the contours of the land so that does reduce erosion uh, particularly um, water erosion so that you don't have big landslides. almost done. No-till agriculture is, well, not tilling because when you plow and till the land you're turning the soil upside down, you're killing weeds, which that part could be good, but um, when you're breaking up the soil you're also breaking up the soil that was attached to plant roots and keeping those plants um, in place. And so when you till and you're moving that, that soil around you're just really disturbing the soil. So no-till agricultures is basically leaving the crop residue in the field. So you see here that um, this is a soybean crop and they left the residues of a corn crop left over from the previous season. So they'll just plant the crops in between the residues. So it reduces um, emission of CO2 because the soil undergoes less oxidation from not moving it around. Because remember if you were going to build your own um, compost pile you have to constantly oxygenate and um, aerate the area which is moving around the soil and so that contributes to CO2 being released. Integrated pest management is a real careful plan used by farmers um, to try to minimize how much pesticide they are going to use. So again with crop rotation maybe they won't have to use as much pesticide depending on the crop. Um, planting pest resistant crop varieties so that would be a GMO but then that at least reduces the use of 
um, pesticides, whether it be synthetic or organic, creating habitats for predators. So if predators for the pests have some place to go, then less pesticide is needed to spray on the crop. And then limited use of pesticide. Maybe you don't need to um, use a crop duster, the plane, and, and spray pesticide all over the crop. Maybe you only need it for a little bit or a little location. So uh, integrated pest management is um, is a method that does take time because farmers need to really see what's out there in their crops, but it, it's much easier on the environment. That's just showing you um, before farmers would be trained with how to use integrated pest management, notice afterwards they didn't use as much. And when it came to their harvest, they actually had more uh, crop to harvest after they learned the ways of IPM. Organic um, simply means crops are grown without synthetic pesticides or fertilizers. Now notice that that means synthetic pesticides or fertilizers. So that doesn't mean they don't use any of that. They will use uh, pesticides or fertilizers. It's just not synthetic. And so over the last few years, organic has been getting um, you know, bigger as far as its popularity, but it's still for now um, going to be more expensive because organic farmers tend to have smaller um, crop areas, smaller farms, um, and they don't, and they use more conventional farming practices, which means their labor costs are higher, um, and so they'll have to sell their products at a higher price to order to, in order to get back some of those costs. CAFOs you saw in Food Inc. Which I don't like them, but that's where we're getting most of our food. Oops. I don't know if I can get this. Harvesting of fish and shellfish. So a fishery is a commercially harvestable population of fish within a particular ecological region. Sometimes it's hard to capture fish because fish do not belong to any one particular country since they will swim various places throughout their life. So no country really has an incentive to protect their fish stocks because the ocean don't belong, I mean because the fish don't belong to any one nation. And so tragedy of the commons um, it is highly exemplified in fish and, and fisheries. More countries catching more than they really should and uh, they're therefore leading others to not get any. Um, and so many fisheries have had a collapse in which um, they lose their fish population by 90% or more. A problem with the way that they're going after fish, which could be um, uh, dragging the nets across the ocean floor, which, you know, that's tearing up the ocean floor, it tears up the coral reefs, and, and then they include bycatch, so they're actually catching things they don't want to catch. So sharks, sea turtles, dolphins. Um, the, the large nets are called dredging nets. Or very long fishing lines where they'll have like this um, long, like really long line, fishing line, and then, you know, every you know, a few inches or so, there's another hook with bait on it. And so they'll catch the fish that way. So it's just, you know, like a thousand fishing poles connected to one another. So sustainable fishing is basically not fishing in an area until that population can recover, which sounds perfectly legitimate. This is just showing you global fish production. So although some fisheries have collapsed, our ability to grow fish has um, increased because of aquaculture and aquaculture is using basically farms to grow fish um, or shellfish and that's putting them in these these containers um, whether it be fresh water or ocean water and then just growing them in a in a smaller area the problem with those is that again as you saw in food inc they're feeding the fish cornmeal which fish don't eat corn. They're feeding them antibiotics since they're all located with so close to one another and they're never out in the open ocean. And so those antibiotics get passed on to people. Um, 
and so I'm leery of 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 eating so much fish not you know not just from the mercury from the tuna but from you know antibiotics possibly getting into my regular white fish or salmon okay the other pro uh, problem with um, aquaculture locations is the waste especially if you're going to be um, well actually it doesn't matter if you're in the ocean or freshwater you know in one end of the farm you have fresh water being pumped in and then the wastewater that has all the feces and antibiotic and food is pumped out the other end and it's right back into the the river or ocean so it's getting the waste from it and that is the end of chapter 11